All right, welcome everyone. Brandy here, and uh, we are bringing to you our Bible study on discerning the voice of God. So this is week 10, and um, we are talking about how God speaks with authority. So for the entire section two, we have learned, I'm sorry, I'm flipping through really fast, uh, that Number one, when he speaks, his voice is persistent. He is persistent. Uh, we're going to see examples pop up all over the place in the scripture, uh, driving down the road, uh, conversation that we have with a friend, a family member, whatever the case may be. Um, but we're going to hear a message and things are going to be like, well, wait a minute. I read something about this and I read about it here and I heard about it here. And so oftentimes um, that's a good indication of God trying to get your attention. Uh, he speaks to us personally. Uh, so there are some things that are going on and um, he's going to talk to you personally. Some things he's gonna convict you of, but you're not to hold other people accountable to the things that he convicted you of. This is your relationship with God. This is him speaking directly to you. He's gonna make the message personal. Um, in chapter seven, we learned that he brings peace. Uh, and we've talked a lot about the, the peace that you feel once a decision is made, uh, once you finally go, okay, this is the direction I'm going to take. This is this, uh, um, area in which I'm going to step out of the boat onto the water and trust in him because he is leading me this way. Um, I've heard his message loud and clear because he was persistently pursuing me. Um, I know that it's a message for me. It's very personal to me. He's speaking directly to me. And now that I've made that decision, I am at peace. However, there's also going to be challenge and that was chapter eight. The reminder of that just because there's peace doesn't mean that it's going to be uh, easygoing, um, straight and narrow path kind of thing. There are going to be challenges and he's going to be with us every single step of the way for those challenges. And then last week we talked about the fact that when we hear the voice of God, and we are making sure that it truly is his voice. The Holy Spirit is never going to contradict what's in his word. And that is the Bible. And so I need you in your Bible every single day. God needs you there because that's where he's speaking most directly to us is through his word. And if we don't know his word, then we're going to question whether that voice that we're hearing, is that really the Holy Spirit guiding me? Because it sounds really good and it sounds like it might be in the Bible and it might be of God. But the enemy is tricky and he's going to try to talk to you in ways that are so similar that sound to be right um, because he doesn't want us in God's word knowing the difference. He wants us thinking, oh, well, that sounds about right. I'll do that. Uh, so we've got to be in his word because when he is speaking to us, he's never going to contradict what's already been stated in the Bible. Um, the Holy Spirit is that communication piece. He's dwelling within us. He is that guideline. And remember, three and one, okay? Three and one. And so it's they're one and the same, but that's the communication piece, that Holy Spirit who's speaking directly, and that's how you hear God. Uh, and this week, we're going to talk about chapter 10, the fact that he speaks with authority. And this one screams so loudly at me. Um, I will pull out... Uh, the things that I highlighted and underlined and things like that. But the thing that I love is that the deeper I've gotten into this, the easier it's getting for me to relate it directly to examples from my own life. So I'm not having to rely on Priscilla's um, examples every single time, which is what I was hating doing in the first place. Um, I love doing Bible studies. I love doing uh, studies with books that center around concepts in the Bible, such as this one. I especially love using uh, a lot of Priscilla Schreier's work. But at the same time, I just feel like you can go and read this on your own. Why do you need me? But then again, God's like, you're going to do this. And so I'm like, okay, I don't know why. Um, other than uh, it is one way that I can reach out and uh, share his word and his love with others. And hopefully you're sharing as well, because that's what we're called to do. We are, share, we are called to share about Jesus, his redemption, our salvation through that redemption, um, He's our savior and we've got to let others know because there, believe it or not, there are people in our very own neighborhoods who have never heard of Jesus before. 
I know, hard to fathom in this day and age, but it's true. So let's get into chapter 10. Chapter 10, he speaks with authority. And so Priscilla starts off sharing about how she's in the middle of prayer and a friend's name who hasn't, she hasn't really spoken with in a while uh, pops into her head and she's like, okay, I got to get back to my prayer. This is prayer time. I'm not supposed to interrupt my prayer time. And then there's scripture and it pops again. And so she's like, wait a minute. Remember what I said about how God tries to get our attention? And so she just kept feeling this overwhelming sense of, I need to pray for this friend. I need to, and then she got this, like, you need to call this friend. And it turns out her friend was struggling her. Um, she, she was having to take care of all the kids at home, still try to work full time at home. Uh, the laundry was piling up. There was a lot of things going on. So what happened? Um, the scripture that happened to pop into Priscilla's head happened to be love thy neighbor. And so she ended up at our friend's house helping fold laundry to help ease some of the burden. So it's something as simple as that. It's not even that you have to go out and do world-changing activity. Um, it sometimes is just as simple as going to help fold a load of laundry. And so he speaks with authority. He's going to get our attention and he's going to say, this is what you're going to do. Um, so moving on, um, whenever you hear God's voice, um, I'm thinking of a, the song about the fire burning in my soul. So she refers to those parts of scripture often, and it is an overwhelming feeling when God is speaking directly to you. Um, she compares, uh, she talks about the peace, the assurance, the authority, the just do it kind of attitude, um, voice that you hear at that moment. So the closer you get in a relationship with God, the more you're speaking with him and more importantly, listening to what he has to say, uh, you're going to be able to recognize these so much quicker and so much faster. Now I'm on page 145 of this particular edition. And, um, I tried to find a relation to the other edition, the one with the white cover. Um, I didn't find it right away. So if it's there, I promise, you know, it's there. I just didn't find it immediately. So I can't share that with you right now. Uh, but on page 145, she shares that when the Holy Spirit speaks, his voice comes with power and authority. It hits you deep. It grips you. Your heart burns. It's him. You know it. And then she shares this um, quote by Pat Ashley. Pat Ashley shares, I know that God is speaking when his voice is so powerful that it comforts, heals, instructs, corrects, and gives wisdom in only a few words. That's the power of our almighty God. Um, so she moves into a section. She calls it feel the burn. Uh, and she shares about how when the scribes spoke, it was one thing. They were having to do kind of what I have to do. I'm relying on other people's words. And I've got my cue cards. I've got my book right in front of me. Uh, I've got the notes that I've taken. I look things up. I look up references. But when Jesus spoke, when um, he gave the Sermon on the Mount, and the crowds were amazed at his teaching, he spoke with authority. He didn't have to consult all these other books. He didn't have to uh, pull up his cue card, so to speak. He is God. He spoke with authority. He knows what he's talking about. And it was just, it's such a different uh, feeling. And so the crowds were wowed because of that power and authority. So kind of thinking about your own um, job or something. So think about the thing that you are an expert in that you can do and you can teach others about without having to crack open another book because you have done it for so long and you are knowledgeable. And so you stand up and you speak and the crowd just eats out of your hand. That's what we're talking about here. Jesus speaking that Sermon on the Mount and the crowds just, he didn't have to rely on all the other stuff. So there was a huge difference and there was this burning desire um, within them after his speaking. Um, and, and so if we move over to 146, she shares, when God speaks, his voice is notable by its resonance, depth, and impact. It pulses with a calm, steady force that makes a clear impression on your soul. It is the burning fire that the prophet Jeremiah described, um, New Little Jeremiah 20 verse 9. And it's the hammer which shatters a rock. And again, that's Jeremiah 23, 29. So like the disciples on their way to Emmaus, you're moved to stillness as you reflect on what you've seen and heard. So it's 
this overwhelming feeling and it's not always a feeling we're gonna talk about that it's more than just a feeling um, but there is a strong feeling inside and you feel all of it all at once the fire the calmness everything Psalm 39 3 says my heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned think about that dwell on that for a little bit pause this video go look it up read it and reread it over and over how does that apply in your life now let's go a little bit further because um it is more than just a feeling and that's what Priscilla shares in here and that's what I want y'all to realize it's more than just a feeling because we can feel feelings okay um, doesn't always mean it's from God um, so let's get back to that whole authority piece and it being more than just a feeling um, several videos we've talked about you've got to know God's Word you've got to get the scripture embedded within you so that way it's there at any given moment it's not a, oh let me go google these words and see what the scripture says it's inside of you because you have dwelled in his word you've spent time in his word you've reflected on his word as i move to 147 she shares the more scripture you had in your heart the more frequently and diligently you read it and reread and meditate on its truths the more opportunity you give the holy spirit to bring it quickly to mind punctuated at a specific moment with a personalized message for you so in those moments like what she was sharing with the prayer and her friend's name popped up and then later on scripture popped up and it related directly to her friend and uh things like that that's what we're talking about is in those moments the scripture just comes straight to you um i debated on whether to share this particular um, story of myself right now or later on but i'm gonna go ahead and share it now so my go-to verse has always been Romans 8, 28. So go look that one up. Um, it has been my go-to verse since I was 15, 16 years old. So we're talking um, 23 to 25 years, somewhere in that range. Um, that has been my go-to verse. Um, it has brought me through, you know, moving. It's brought me through um, divorce. It's brought me through um, challenging times with my kiddos, whether it's medically or just behaviorally <laughs> um, uh, but most important it has been my go-to for change period in the story we know what people feel about change um, we like to say we like change but then when change comes we don't exactly always embrace it um, so when I started in education I swore I was going to teach kindergarten well that didn't happen I taught third grade um, and I also swore that I would never leave the classroom, that I would stay in the classroom, retire teaching from the classroom because I thought that's where I was supposed to be all the time. And well, Tori was born in 08 and during that time period, I had interviewed for a first grade position. I did not receive that first grade position. Somebody else did. Um, but I was approached by my principal at the time and she's like, I've got a different position for you. And it was early literacy interventionist. And I was like, that's perfect. That's right up my alley. I teach ELA. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about reading. This gets me back, you know, working with younger kids as well as some older kids. So I spent a year doing that. I went to a training at the district office. Um, cause we were piloting some things in three different schools in our just two or three different schools. Can't remember. Um, have it to mind. And I went to a training at my office at my district office and we had a restroom break so coming out of the restroom and my math coach at the time goes so how are you liking your position I thought it was a strange question I just kind of answered um went on about my life well next thing I know I'm getting questioned by no longer my principal because she had moved to the uh, district office that year and she shared with me a proposition she shared that another school was looking to have an instructional facilitator, so an instructional coach, um, because the district was going to, even though the state had stopped funding such things, um, the district was going to use some of the stimulus money to uh, provide those positions for each of the schools uh, because they knew they couldn't do it on something that was going to be a permanent fixture because this money was to be used and then it was going to be gone. I said I had to pray about it, but honestly, Romans 8.28 flashed through my mind. It was like God, like, was like, boom, 
them right there. Um, and so I knew. And so I have had to hang on to that because I struggle with confidence a lot. And there are times that this position is hard because you are in the middle. Um, you're not administration. You're not evaluative. But you're not the teacher. And so um, you get pulled and you, you're, you're in the know on some things um, administrative wise. And then the teachers, you should be even as a coach with the teachers, but teachers don't see us that way. And that's, it's sad and unfortunate um, because we've got sports teams and, you know, you pay extra to have all kinds of coaches uh, to, to give you these little tips and tricks and tweaks that will up your game and help you perform better. Um, education doesn't view coaches always that way. Now, there are some teachers who value their coaches and they love them to death, um, but it's just, it's a tricky, fine line. And I love doing what I do, but it's not always easy. And so sometimes the confidence factor plays for me and I will have self-doubt. And then God reminds me of that moment in May of 2009 when I was convicted that this is the role, this is where I'm going to step out into. And so I have been doing this since 2009. And it's kind of scary that I've spent more time coaching than I have in the classroom now. Um, but I get to impact so many. And that's what I what people ever had to remind me of. Because I was like, well, maybe they just want me to do that. Get me out of a classroom. And so people have been like, no, Brandy. They wanted you to step into this role because you can benefit and impact so many others. So it's hard for me to rem to remember that. And so Romans 8, 28, flashing in my mind then and as my hang on to, especially there's been changes. I have not stayed at the same school. I've not always had the same administration. Uh, I have been at the same school for several years now. But this year I'm having to switch back and forth between two schools. And of all times to have to balance life between two schools, uh, we're going through this pandemic and this whole virtual and hybrid and um, so, so it's and all these extra precautions and I'm not a germaphobe. Um, so, and, and I'm very much, a, I would not let my children in my classroom use hand sanitizer, hand soap, but no hand sanitizer because personally for me, hand sanitizer stripped so much from me. I stayed sicker than ever when I used hand sanitizer. So I absolutely refuse to use such things. Um, unless I'm forced to, I mean, even in church with communion, I would sometimes miss communion Sundays because I did not want to put that stuff on my hands because I, it, so many reasons. Um, so I'm not the germaphobe, so I'm going to be the one that people are concerned about. Um, but amazingly, my students were almost always in the classroom. Um, even the ones that you're like, can you just be absent for a day? <laughs> um, uh, just so I can have a little tiny one day break. Um. We love y'all. And those actually are my favorite kids, to be honest. Uh, but um, I'm in this role for a reason. And then, you know, Romans 8.28, when our youth director um, and music director said he needed a uh, youth coordinator. It's like, okay, here I am. Crazy me, because I said I've never worked with anybody over nine years old. So how, knowing God's word, and I know that's just one example from my personal life. And I know people are probably tired of hearing my story, but this is my story. And that's, you know, maybe somebody hasn't heard it and they need to hear it again. Or maybe somebody hasn't heard it and they need to hear it for the first time. Sorry, not again. Because if you haven't heard it, there's no again to it. Uh, or maybe, you know, it's just like rereading. You read something one time in one situation in your life and it hits you one way. And then you read it again and it hits you a totally different way. So you've got to have words, God's word in here, not just in the book. And so that way in your prayer time or when you're driving down the road or when you're asked a question in the restroom of your district office, <laughs> um, you know, you'll know that things are from God um, because that scripture is going to pitch you, bam, out of nowhere. You're going to be like, whoa, where did that come from, God? This is so not the direction I was taking in my life. Um, so know his word. Get it in here because that's going to matter um, dramatically and it's going to impact your life in so many ways. Um, so moving on, um, let's see, I've like totally like lost where we were. So she shares a lot about, you know, um, are we doing things for ourselves or are we doing it to glorify God? So like gift giving is an example. She shared that, you know, she loved doing that and, uh, she was out buying gifts for her friends one time and then she was convicted. The scripture hit her and she's like, Oh, Giving is something I'm trying to do to get accolations for myself. And so I shouldn't do it this time. 
And so we've got to be aware of things like that. When we have scripture flash across our mind or that, hmm, should you really do that? Uh, stop and pay attention. It says, when you're in the scripture, you shouldn't only be watching for thou shalt and thou shalt not and checking off your reading plan schedule. Those are important, but she's suggesting that there should be a fine tune, a tuning of your spiritual ears to notice the moment when a passage captures your attention in an almost shocking way. Remember that bathroom moment I was sharing? Um, drawing your thoughts immediately to a personal circumstance in which it applies. So maybe it's not your personal thing that's going on. Maybe it's about the friend or the family member, uh, whatever the case may be. And then I want you to ask yourself, because this is most likely God that's speaking to you at these, in these moments. Ask yourself, why is this verse communicating to me so directly right now? What does it mean? Does God have a reason for putting me in this particular zip code of scripture on this particular day when I'm right in the middle of this particular circumstance? Okay, I'm going to repeat that. So ask yourself, when these things happen to you and you, the, the God's word is like right there, bam, and you have this overwhelming uh, uh, feeling going on, um, and it draws your attention and it's like, hey, wake up, hello, right here. Ask yourself, why is this verse communicating to me so directly right now? What does it mean? Does God have a reason for putting me in this particular zip code of scripture on this particular day when I'm right in the middle of this particular circumstance? Um, so, you know, it could be that you're reading the Bible and then all of a sudden, boom, this particular verse stands out to you and it's just gripping you. Um, so she shares, don't just like rush ahead with your reading. Stop right there. Lock your eyes onto those words. God's speaking to you. He's speaking to you with authority because his authority is right there in his word. And when he draws your attention to it right there, um, wake up, pay attention, slow down. All right. When scripture or verse or its message hits you out of nowhere while you're in the middle of your day, don't dismiss it. So sometimes you're just driving down the road and boom, that verse pops into your head. You need to reflect on that. You need to spend time in that. Um, I'm not saying, you know, pull up your phone and pull out that scripture and study right then because you're driving. Be safe. Um, but oftentimes for me anyways, it's always, it tends to be out of the blue and sudden. And so I need to hang on to that somehow, some way. So find a way that works for you to do that. So you can be in his word um, because he doesn't want you to dismiss that he has a message for you. It's personal and he is speaking to you with authority and you better pay attention. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> um, I didn't underline this one, but every time you open your Bible or sit under its teaching, God gives you his general revelation. So there's the general part of it, but then the stopping and paying attention, that's when he really needs you to zone in. Okay. Um, so my other, my pink Bible that stays in the car because I take it to church with me is full of notes. Um, the Bible that I read when I'm on here or working with the youth is my NIV version. It's a student Bible. Um, so I use sticky notes in there because there's not margins to write in. Um, so, so find a way that uh, you will have something with you at all times to be able to jot down notes from your scripture readings, from sermons you're hearing, from uh, podcasts you're listening to, whatever the case may be. Whew. Now, remember that the Bible is not a dead um, document. It's not written of old and just a history um, book. The Bible is alive. It applies a new and fresh to us in every single generation. Um, so he's not revealing new doctrine to us, but because the the word is alive, um, it applies new, fresh to us every single day. Okay, it, it's applicable right now, no matter what. Um, God's word is living. When you read it, you should feel the warmth of his breath rising from the page as the scripture applies it to your particular situation, regardless of how specific or personal. I had to underline that. It's on page 150 because I am a lover of language and this just, it was, it was so elegantly written. God's word is living. When you read it, you should feel the warmth of his breath rising from the page as the spirit applies it to your particular situation, regardless of how specific or personal. So even the generalities that you may not realize, it's God breathed, okay? 
So when you're reading scripture, you God's with you all the time. But when you're reading his word, can you just imagine as you're reading and just imagine it's his breath coming up off of that page, his word, his essence. Mm. Um, I don't know how many of you um, know Anne Graham Lotz, but she shares something about Anne Graham Lotz. And I have personally read a book from her called Why. Uh, and it was great during a time when we were first getting diagnoses for my son, uh, because sometimes we question, why is this happening in my life? Why the bad? Um, and you got to learn to focus on the positive and that God will help you overcome all this. So just remember that. But Anne Graham Lott said, I never make a major decision in life, especially one that will affect another person before I have received direction from God. Um she goes on and shares, when circumstances would have made me doubt a decision, his word has carried me through and not once has he led me on a wrong path. Um, so like I was sharing earlier with my Romans 828 in the bathroom and moving into a co coaching role, um, I have to remind myself of when I took that step and his overpowering, loud, booming voice that screamed Romans 8, 28 in the bathroom that day. Um, and it kind of brings me back to reality. And it's okay. Bob Sword says, Things don't change when I talk to God. Things change when God talks to me. When I talk, nothing happens. When God talks, the universe comes into existence. And so we've got to remember to shut up. Um, I know I've said that in previous uh, lessons, and it's a great reminder right now. We've got to shut up and let God talk and let God work. Um, and, of course, we have to be active with that. So, anyways, <laughs> um, as we close out this chapter, there's a few more things I want to share with you. On page 151, she says, there's no code for you to crack, no puzzle he's waiting for you to put together, no stick he's dangling in your peripheral vision then snatching away when you turn your head. He's not sitting up in heaven with the camera rolling and stopping er, and stopwatches ticking, testing whether or not you're spiritually sharp enough to figure out the next move that he wants you to make. God has taken upon himself the burden of responsibility for communicating with you. And that's why he made sure his word is alive. So you've got to be in his word. I don't know how many times we got to say this. Um, and just a reminder that Priscilla says she no longer goes around searching for God's will. Instead, she diligently searches for God. Um, I think that's a mind shift that I'm making with this particular study. I'm not sure how you are taking it. Um, I'd love to hear your comments. Um, but the uh, searching for God, not God's will. Because when our relationship with God builds and strengthens and his word is embedded on our, inside of us, and we know how to recognize his voice. It's so different than saying, okay, God, what's your will for my life? So very different. Um, so keep your spiritual ears op open and you'll be able to hear and recognize when he's speaking. And if you need a reminder, I shared a video on this page um, a couple of times. And it's such a beautiful representation of being able to listen and the fact that we really got to know God's voice from all the others because the enemy's going to try to get you. And the only way we can do that is by being in his word. So I'll close with this before I share the chapter challenges. He's going to speak persistently. He's going to speak personally. He's going to speak with peace. He's going to speak with challenge and he'll roll it all together in the eternal counsel of his truth until his message echoes in your heart with heavenly authority. Now that's the voice of God. And that brings us to the end of part two. So next week we'll move into part three, which is remember what he wants to accomplish. So now that we know how he speaks to us persistently, personally, with peace, with challenge and with authority, now that we know all of this, we know what to listen for. Be in his word. Our chapter challenges. Expect God's voice to resonate with an authority and weight that other influences do not have. Realize that scripture is not just the boundary into which everything God says will fall, but is itself the chief means through which he will speak. Watch for the spirit to personalize scripture, making it connect with your current circumstances. I love how she uses the current because uh, we get caught up in the past a lot. 
Uh, the responsibility for our knowing God's will falls primarily on him. Do not be burdened by fear of failure or paralyzed by not knowing. At the right time, he will reveal his will. Relationship with God first, okay? Um, if you are being obedient regarding the responsibilities he has placed before you today, you are in his will for your life. Let us go to God in prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, thank you so much for these past few weeks of we, as we have learned uh, how to listen for your voice, as we've learned that your message, that you're going to persistently pursue us, that your message is going to be personal to each and every single one of us, that you're going to be a, a peace, an amazing peace um, when you speak to us, but you're also going to bring challenge and you've prepared us for those challenges and you're going to see us through those challenges as it strengthens each and every single one of us. And thanks for the reminder that you speak with authority, that nothing that is uh, said to us through you is going to contradict things that you've said before. That while the Bible was written many years ago and the story uh, was written so many years ago and so many people see the Bible as a history book, Lord, that that's your word and it's alive and beating. And every time we open the book, help us to remember that you are breathing those words into our life. Help us to imprint them inside of us so that we know the messages that we hear are coming straight from you because you speak with that authority, that peace, that challenge, that personal message, and that persistence. Lord, I ask that you touch and bless each and every single person that is viewing this video. I ask that uh, you encourage them to reach out to, to me, to each other. Let us be a uh, a group, a cohort that can build each other up, that each of us can lean on so that way we can go out and spread your light, spread your love and share of your grace and mercy, share of salvation, repentance, and all that you need us to do and help us to glorify you and build your kingdom for it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray all these things amen all right all right so uh i said something in the video a little while ago and i am feeling kind of odd about what i said um so i mentioned that i'm not a germaphobic and i'm afraid that might have implied that I was calling everybody else a germaphobe. And that is not my intention at all. I just wanted to make you very aware of that. Um, I do believe in hand washing with soap. I'm just not a hand sanitizer person. So that's why, you know, uh, I, I do think that people are gonna be concerned when they see me and I'm not like using hand sanitizer 470,000 times a day. Um, but I will wash my hands. There's a difference um, than between not doing anything at all, okay? <laughs> and. <clears throat> When I said I'm not a germaphobic, I feel like that implied that I was saying everybody else is. And uh, I, I use that term because so many people have gotten on and said, you know, this is great because I'm such a germaphobe. Da, 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 da. Uh, and so I'm just I'm just the opposite. And um, I know there are people that are like me. Uh, and I think germaphobe can have a negative connotation. And I don't want it to sound that way. And I sincerely apologize if I offended anybody. Um, that was not my intent at all. 